Good evening to everyone here in the House Marion, nearby the Goetheanum, and also all around where you are. It's a pleasure greeting you for this lecture in our series of lectures given by the General Anthroposophical Section on the Jewish Humanism. So 2021, we decided in this section that besides all other topics we work with, of course, the work of Steiner, the written work of Steiner, the lectures, his biography, the studies of anthroposophy and the deepening of the esoteric school of the Goetheanum, we also would like to study and to enwiden the possibility to see all these contributions given during the 20th century out of a humanistic perspective on the human being. And so we started with Martin Buber and Franz Rosenzweig. And these lectures are now in a little book. The name of the book is The Presence of the Other, Die Gegenwart des Anderen, a book written until now only in German. And last year we had then the lectures about Primo Levi, Simon Weil, Hannah Arendt and Hans Jonas. And the book containing these lectures just appeared. In German the name is Widerstand und Verantwortung, what would mean in English something as resistance and responsibility. And as I said before, for now they are in German. Of course, we would love to make it possible for people to read them also in English. Let's see if a translation will be possible. And this year, 2023, we continued then with Gustav Landauer, with Maria Darmstädter, now today Emmanuel Levinas, and next week there will be the lecture about Paul Celan. And you are all invited to join on next Thursday. You will see the exact time and also the link so that you can also hear the lecture about this very important poet of the 20th century. Of course, speaking about this Jewish humanists, this Hebrew humanist, as Martin Buber called this approach to the human being, a possible approach to the image of a human human being, gains another color or maybe another existentiality now facing the war that is still going on in Israel, in Palestine. And the earnesty of all these topics, also the earnesty of the topics that Emmanuel Levinas thought about during the 20th century can appear again in the absolute openness of that, what we can transform or what we have to transform out of the recognition of the humanity of the human being. Yeah, I would like to start with a quote and I'm not sure if this is a good idea because this is not a simple quote, but uh, not the whole evening will be like that. I just thought on starting with this quote because it expressed very deeply the struggle and the existential search of Emmanuel Levinas, who lived, we can say, almost through the whole 20th century. He was born in 1905 in Kaunas, Lithuania, um, and he died 1995. That means he really was there from the beginning on of this century and until the very end he could experience all these challenges, all this terrible destruction, but also the hope that was always also there. 
And today, before I read the quote, I would like to introduce just some little biographical notes, then some main topics of that, what he developed in his work. And then I would like to read little pieces, little parts of different, of different books so that we can also dive a little bit in his thinking that is very dense and that can also evoke a very contemplative relation to the activity of thinking. Yeah, so this quote is from a book, Some Reflections About the Philosophy of the Hitlerism. It was first published 1934. And at that point, Levinas already had a sensation of what was going on and on what would maybe happen. And it starts with the question, is it possible for the human being to be a human being before he takes responsibility for the other? I will read it in a few moments. Because this responsibility finally is that what enables him to name himself a human being. This, what Levinas will call an election. It is a decision, it is an election. And this election, he will say here in this quote, comes from God. He says, from our God or from God. God who looks to the human being from the face of the other human being from the fellow human being. Yeah, so the quote, does the subject reach the human state before taking responsibility for the other human being in the election that rises him to this level of being a human being? A election that comes from a God or from God, who looks at him in the face of the other human being, his fellow human being, the original place of revelation. I read it again. Does the subject reach the human state before taking responsibility for the other human being in the election that raises him to this level of being a human being, an election that comes from a God or from God who looks at him in the face of the other human being, his fellow human being, the original place of revelation. Yeah, as I said, he was born in a Jewish family in Kaunas in Lithuania. His father was a bookseller, and this was very important for him. I will come to that back later. His relation to the books in general, and specifically to the sacred books, to the Bible, uh, was very, very important during his whole life. He studied Hebrew from little on in the Torah, but also at the same time, he had a very, very consistent classical education, reading Shakespeare, Gogol, Dostoevsky, Pushkin, and so many others. His family emigrated to Kharkov in the Ukraine during the First World War, and there he witnesses from there the Russian Revolution. In 1923, he moved to, Fran to France, and there he studied philosophy in Strasbourg. After that, he studied in Freiburg with Husserl and Heidegger. In 1930, he completed his doctoral thesis on the theory of intuition in Husserl's phenomenology, Husserl's theory of intuition. He went to Paris, where he studied Hegel with Koyev, among others. He also took part in the famous philosophical encounters organized by Gabriel Marcel. And then he started publishing 
And also he started 1934 to work in Paris at a training institute for Jewish teachers. He was granted French citizenship in 1930 and mobilized as a French in 1939 and taken then as a German prisoner of war in 1940. In 1945, he first learned that his entire family, his parents and his brothers, who had remained in Lithuania, had been murdered. And then he swore never to go back to Germany. 1946, he became the head of the Col Normale Israelite Oriental in Paris. And there he taught philosophy. And then he started publishing also um, studies about the Talmud, which he was intensively studying. He began 1957 to participate regularly in the colloquias of Jewish intellectuals in France. And 1961, he made his, um, his he wrote his work about totality and infinity and he was offered a, a professorship at the University of Portier. He wrote several articles and made also translations from the work of Husserl and Heidegger, and through that both German thinkers become first in the late 40s very well known in France. In 1967, he was appointed professor at the University of Nanterre and 1973 at the Sorbonne. In Nanterre, he worked together with Paul Ricoeur and he published many books. And for many, many years also, in the last years, every Saturday morning, he gave a lesson on the Bible passage of the week at the synagogue of the Ecole Normale Israelite Oriental. And many people, lots of people joined to these lectures, to, the, to these lessons he gave. He received lots of prizes. 1991, he wrote the book Between Us, Essays on the Thinking of the Other, and he died on the 25th of December, 1995 in Paris. For Levinas, both the philosophers of the Western tradition and also the prophets, the scripture, the Torah, are essential pillars for the human thinking. The books for him represented from the very beginning on an essence of the spiritual activity. He he, he used to say that each book demands a necessary link to hermeneutics as it is not imposing in se itself by force, but as it remains dependent on the human questioning. And for him, the scripture fulfilled a great task because the scripture changed the relationship the human beings had before to the soil, to the belonging. He says that before the Bible, before the scripture appears to Moses and from then on, from there on, lives within the people, the understanding of the own relation to the earth, the understanding of the belonging, was very much connected and localized to the soil, to the place, where people was living, to a single part of the earth. And now I quote him, on the dry ground of the desert, where nothing takes root, the true spirit come down in a text to be universally fulfilled. On the dry ground of the desert, where nothing takes root, the true spirit came down in a text to be universally fulfilled. This is a quote from his book, Difficult Freedom. 
Yeah, he says that the scripture came down not to judge the life of the people in the desert and not to forbid anything, but to lay down how to dwell on the land without feeling ownership, how to make it fruitful without worshipping it and without hurting the ones who lives with you. The scripture also came to open the view on how it's possible to look to the world as a creation. So this double dimension was very important for him. On one hand, learning to live on earth according to the commandments. And on the other hand, to see the world as a creation. And so he says the scripture, the fact that the human being suddenly or well at that point received a written text, a text that can be read, a text that can be heard, enables the human being to have a total different relation to his relation to the earth and to the world. And for him so far, the Bible was essential also for thinking and was not something only connected to religion. It was an essential pillar for the human being in his, for his self-understanding. And in this sense, we can say that he thinks differently as most of the other philosophers at his time. Most of them had the opinion that the, that the tradition of the Western thought has its origins only in Greece. Heidegger, as an example, spoke a lot about that, that our Western conception of the human being as a human of knowledge relies on the history of philosophy in Greece. And we can't say that all these philosophers of the beginning of the 20th century ignore the Bible, of course not, but for sure they consider that the Bible commits to faith and not to thought. And Levinas clearly differs from them because for him, the Hebrew, the Hebrew text of the Bible, the Torah, also gives a light about the human being in the, in the path of understanding the human being through knowledge. Yeah. And he also said that why not to quote biblical passages of the Talmudic wisdom as a heart of the philosophical test in the same way as others used to quote poets. <clears throat> For him, clearly, there was not the possibility to think the human being as a being that gains his own humanity just from the force of being himself. He was a student of Heidegger, as I said before, and he dealt for a long time, for years, with Heidegger's work, with Heidegger's thinking, thinking based on this concept of the understanding of the human being in his Dasein, in his being, in his being on earth, in his being in the world. And for Levinas, this concept changed then and was followed by the development of the thought that places the primacy of reality in the other before placing it in the own ego. I will come back to that. For Levinas, in, his develop in the development of his thinking, it became more and more clear that the, the reality of the human being can't rely only in the human being as an individual, but is 
absolutely related to the other and he will say that the other has primacy and is before the own ego. And then he will elaborate the idea that the subject itself is something that the other will enable to be. And finally then, he will attempt to a new ethical foundation and he will name that the ethic as the first philosophy. Ethic will be for him the first philosophy. That means to act in regard to the reality of the otherness of the others. So, a very important question is the whole question of freedom. And Levinas understand that in the traditional idea of individual freedom, there is a danger. And the danger is that first I will see that I am here and that my freedom is related to the fulfilling of my own intentions, of my own desires. And Levinas will say that the other stands before my freedom, that the other and my responsibility to the other advises me to turn, to turn towards him and that this will be prior as I am for myself in my freedom. He says that we, the human beings need to go back behind freedom and that means to, to enable the other and the needs of the other to be present in my consciousness before I look to that what would be my own need. The primacy of the responsibility, he will say, the primacy of the responsibility over the freedom. Clearly, and he will come back and back to this thought and develop it and, yeah, and name it again and again, there is a supremacy, a primacy of the responsibility over the freedom. His philosophy explicitly refers to the words of Hillel in the Talmud, which he reproduces in the translation. And now I quote Hillel. Maybe you know this phrase. It's a very well-known one of the Talmud. Hillel says, if I am not responsible for myself, who is to be responsible for me? But if I, am not, if I am only responsible for myself, I am still me. I read it again. If I am not responsible for myself, who is to be responsible for me? But if I am only responsible for myself, I am still me. I am still myself. Yeah. And he based his reflections on the idea that there is a sense of election, that the other human being who, who calls, who is a call to me with his needs, with his suffering, elects myself. I am elected to respond. I am elected to answer. I am elected to be there for the other. It's an election given by the fact that we share this common world. And he says that this election makes present the reality of God. So for him, speaking about God is not stranger to thinking philosophically. He says that the extension of our philosophical understanding can happen if we go through this experience of trying to have the inspirations and the intuitions in this infinity. I will come back to that. <clears throat> 
he will speak about the other that becomes visible in the face, the face of the other that calls me, the face of the other in the vulnerability that makes clear for me that I have to turn and to see and to acknowledge the need of the other. For him, many thinkers were important, but he will refer very, very often, especially to Franz Rosenzweig, this German philosopher who was also a student of Hermann Cohen. And he learned, as many others, as Martin Buber and others, they all learned by Hermann Cohen this first um, description of a term that in German is the Mitmensch, the fellow human being. And Hermann Cohen says that in the, in the realization, in taking for real this fellow human being, there is the ground to reach their own humanity. And he uh, quotes from the Leviticus uh, in the scripture, the phrase, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hermann Cohen says, this is the realization or the ground for the realization of the humanity of the human being. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Rosenzweig, in his very, very important book, The Star of Redemption, who uh, Levinas says is so many times quoted in his own writings that he's even not able to say when he is quoting Rosenzweig and The Star of Rede Redemption. Rosenzweig refers in this book to the love of God and he says, God loves the human soul. And the answer of the human soul to the love of God is the love to the other human being. So God loves the human soul and the human being answers to this love in loving the other human being. Yeah. Levinas speaks about the primacy of the goodness. He says the goodness and the evil, I will come back to that a little bit later, they are not symmetric. They are not in the same distance of what I am trying to discover to do in my path. He says that the goodness, the good, is before, is way before the evil and that the goodness can be experienced in this call from the other, from the face of the other, on the vulnerability of the other to myself, that my respond will come out of this goodness. And the German philosopher and theologian Bernhard Kasper, who was a professor and a very, yeah, a, a very, um, well-educated person exactly in all these philosophers of the dialogue. He was a professor in, in Freiburg. He writes in an essay on Emmanuel Levinas about a conversation that he, he had with him. And um, Bernhard Kasper quoted at that point a phrase from Simon Weil, uh, uh, of in, in the little book La Connaissance Surnaturelle, where Simon Weil writes, time is God's waiting, begging for our love. Time is God's waiting, begging for our love. And then Bernhard Kasper says that when, when he said that to Levinas saying, is that what you think? He initially affirmed the sentence, but then, after a 
a break and a pause for reflection, he added, I would say, ordering for our love, commanding for our love. So God expects the human being yeah, to be ready for that, he says. Well, now I would like to bring some thoughts of Levinas in his own voice, in his own language. And of course, it is a translation here. He wrote in French. And if we see the introductions in many of his translated books, the books are translated to many, many languages around the world. But in many of these translations, at least those that I have seen, the translators make comments on how difficult it is to translate him. He has a very special language. It's very contemplative, we can say. We dive into a realm of a very perceiving, very aware, very clear and very deep thinking. So I will read here translations into English. And even so, we can say that we can hear his voice and his way of approaching. And the quotes will be not too long. And I will repeat them, I think. Maybe it will yeah, be possible to, to enter a little bit in this mood. So first, of his book, The Time and the Other, from 1946-47, he writes about time. And as also Franz Rosenzweig developed, he says, thinking is rooted in time. There is no thinking apart of time, out of time. Thinking is related to our capacity to speak and deeply related to our capacity to hear. And hearing and speaking, saying and answering, and hearing, the dialogue, is something that appears in the reality of time. Yeah, now I will quote. However, the relationship to the future, the presence of the future in the present, seems to take place in the situation of face to face with the other. The situation of face to face would be actual realization of time. The overlapping of the present with the future is not the act of a solitary subject, but the intersubjective relationship. The condition of temporality lies in the relationship between human beings. And then he continued, the future is not buried within a pre-existing eternity from which we would extract it. It is absolutely different and new. And this is the only way to grasp the actual reality of time, the absolute impossibility of finding the equivalent of the future in the present the only way to understand the absence of any anticipation of the future. Should I read again? Yes. However, the relationship to the future, the present of the future in the present, seems to take place in the situation of face to face with the other. The situation of face to face would be the actual realization of time. The overlapping of the present with the future is not the act of a solitary subject, but the intersubjective relationship. The condition of temporality lies in the relationship between human beings. The future is not buried within a pre-existent pre eternity from which we would extract it, 
it is absolutely different and new. And this is the only way to grasp the actual reality of time, the absolute impossibility of finding the equivalent of the future in the present, the only way to understand the absence of any anticipation of the future. Yeah, so the time as an event of in-between human beings. Then he writes a wonderful book, and the name is also wonderful. The name is De Dieu qui vient à l'idée, When God Enters Thinking, or Of God Who Comes Into Mind. And here we see, just only in the title, that for him, thinking on God is also part of thinking philosophically. Yeah, this, in this book there are essays that first appeared in 1982, but um, they were written uh, in between 1972 and 1982. Yeah, and I will take one quote where he speaks about the responsibility without reciprocity. So different to what Martin Buber described in the book he published 1923, I and Thou, this very well-known book where Martin Buber says that my I is a reality as soon as there is a thou, as soon as there is another, another human being that allows me to say to myself, I. And Levinas reads and yeah, knows very well these wonderful writings and thoughts on Martin Buber, and he says that he thinks that this relation of the I and the thou is not a symmetrical one. So there is necessarily the possible asymmetry that I take responsible regardless on anything, I am responsible for the call of the need of the other, regardless if this will be also a mutual relation. So for him, responsibility is an obligation without the expectation for reciprocity. Yeah, now I quote him from this book, The Dieu qui vient à l'idée, When God Enters Thinking. Responsibility without concern for reciprocity. I have to be responsible for the other without worrying about the other's responsibility for me. Relationship without reciprocity or love for one's neighbor, which is love without eros, for the other and therefore to God. This is the way of thinking that thinks more than it thinks. I read again. Responsibility without concern for reciprocity. I have to be responsible for the other without worrying about the other's responsibility for me. Relationship without reciprocity or love for one's neighbor, which is love without eros, for the other and therefore to God. This is the way of thinking that thinks more than it thinks. Yeah, isn't it beautiful? This is a way of thinking that thinks more than it thinks. Yeah, then 1980 he wrote a short yeah, essay called Dialogue, Dialogue, and it was written for an encyclopedia. So it is, we can say, not such a difficult text. It was written for an encyclopedia, so supposedly for people who wanted to know what is dialogue. 
Yeah. And in the introduction to this very concise text, he writes the following phrase. The orientation towards a new concept of spirit is perhaps a consequence of the trials that people of the 20th century have undergone since the First World War. The orientation towards a new concept of spirit is perhaps a consequence of the trials that people of the 20th century have undergone since the First World War. So here we see that the experience of this 20th century, and he experienced it by himself very, very deeply, in a very radical way, he lost her fam his family, as I'd said before. So the Shoah was for him a reality, an experienced reality. And he says that perhaps, perhaps a consequence of all that could be an orientation towards a new concept of the spirit. And this is in, in the introduction uh, of this little text about dialogue. So, I quote him now. The relationship in which the I encounters the you or the thou is the original place and circumstance of the arrival of the ethical. The ethical owes nothing to the values, rather it is the values that owe of everything to the ethical. The concrete of the good is this value being of the other. The ambivalence and undecidability of the value being appears only in a formalization as the same distance between good and evil, in the validity of the other human being himself, good is older and prior than evil. So confronting the other, the good is older, he says, is prior, is before the evil. And a little bit further, he writes, the old biblical theme of the human being as the image of God takes on a new meaning. In other words, the similarity, the resemblance, announces itself in the thou and not in the I. The same movement that leads to the other leads to God. I read again. The old biblical theme of a man as the image of God, we remember all this very important theme of the, of the human being as a viva, ima godei, as an image of God. The old biblical theme of the human being as the image of God takes on a new meaning. In other words, this resemblance announces itself in the Tao, and not anymore in the I. The same movement that leads to the other leads to God. And then he will say, the I thou contains from the beginning on its immediate immediacy, that means the form of urgency and without recourse to any universal law. It is an obligation. Without any possible escape, as if it were called, as if it were called and chosen to do so, as if it were therefore irreplaceable and unique, the I is the servant of the thou in the dialogue. An inequality that may seem arbitrary unless it is in the word spoken to the other person 
in the ethics of reception, in the first religious service, in the first prayers, as Paul Valéry says. The first liturgy, religion, through which God enters the mind and the word God himself could have found its way into language and into good philosophy. So this I-thou dialogue asks me as a unique, irreplaceable in my answer to the thou. When I am called by the face of the other in his needs, in her needs, this call is always a call to myself and nobody else will be able to respond to this, to this specific call. Yeah, in a very late text, Between Us, the name is Between Us, attempts on thinking about the other, Levinas speaks uh, or writes about a very radical thought that he developed, not only at that point, and he's not the only thinker of the 20th century that deals with this thought. And the thought is that facing all the suffering of so many people, as he says, this senseless suffering without any sense of all those children, of all those people during the Shoah, but also in other wars, it is not any more possible, he says, to think on theodicy, to think that God is there, omnipresent, omniscient and good, and letting evil happen in that extension. So the idea that God lets evil happen is not any more possible to be sustained, Levinas says, if we see the sufferings of the 20th century. And so I will read um, from this book, Between Us, he writes, perhaps the most revolutionary fact of our consciousness in the 20th century, but also an event of sacred history is the complete destruction of the balance between the explicit and the implicit theodicy of the Western thought and the forms that suffering and its calamities have taken in the course of this century. A century that has seen two world wars, right-wing and left-wing totalitarianisms Hitlerism and Stalinism, Hiroshima, the Gulag, the genocides of Auschwitz and Cambodia, in the space of 30 years. A century that is coming to an end in the fear that everything that these barbaric names symbolize could happen again. Suffering and disaster brought about by free decision, but not limited by any reason when reason became a political rage that was no longer bound by any ethics. The flagrant disproportion between suffering and any theodicy was revealed in Auschwitz with a clarity that stings the eyes. The fact that such a thing was possible calls thousands of years of traditional belief into question. So, he says, this, this balanced relation in between thinking the theodicy and the reality of what happened on the 20th century brings, puts into question a traditional belief of the Western thinking. And now we need to face this question, he says. And then he will write, pain 
in its pure evilness, suffering for nothing. It makes impossible and repulsive any word or thought that would explain it by the sins of those who suffered or died. But does, the, but does this end of theodicy, which is compelling in view of the immeasurable affliction of the century, not at the same time make it clear again how intolerable the suffering of other people is, how scandalous my justification of my neighbor's suffering would be, so that the phenomenon of suffering in its senselessness is basically the suffering of the other. And for every ethical sensibility which asserts itself against this inhumanity in the midst of the inhumanity of our time, for every ethical sensibility, the justification of the pain of the other is definitely the origin of all immorality. So these are very strong words. He says that after this pain, this poor evilness, as he says, this suffering for nothing, any word or thought that would give sense for that, that would explain it as a sins of those who suffered or died, is not possible. And that the end of the theodicy, the end of the thinking that it, would, it, is, it was meant to be like that, again shows to us how, how horrible this senselessness in the suffering has been. And then he says, I read it again, so that the phenomenon of suffering in its senselessness is basically the suffering of the other. And for every ethical sensibility, the justification of the pain of the other is definitely the origin of all immorality. No justification for, for that. Yeah. In his text, Ethics as Prima Philosophia, Ethics as the First Philosophy, he will go back to these thoughts and go back speaking about this vulnerability that we face in the face of the other person and that this vulnerability calls me to an action, to a response, and this response gives me my own humanity. Levinas was uh, very soon known in South America and Central America by thinkers who were also dealing with this experience that the reality of the other demands to think this reality out of the experience of the other. And this was due to, the, to several missionaries that went to very, very poor and remote places in South and Central America as missionaries, as Catholic missionaries. And then they met these people in this deep, deep suffering out of this poverty. And then they asked themselves, what would it mean to tell them that there is a new religion and they should go on Sunday to the Mass, but this had nothing to do with the needs, with the real needs, with the existential needs that these faces were showing them. And so, um, some, many of these uh, very educated missionaries then read and heard about that what uh, Levinas was teaching, was thinking, was writing. And there was a very interesting exchange. Students and professors visited him in, in Belgium, in Loven, and in other places. And they had many, many uh, yeah, dialogues and conversations 
And so for Levinas, also this otherness of the other gains kind of a new face, this poverty of these people living in such not human conditions. And then he speaks about this responsibility for the other also regarding these situations, different situations as he referred before, but similar in this need, in this suffering and in the call to the other to do something, to respond. And so I read now from the text in Ethics as First Philosophy, responsibility for the other, for the next person, in the nakedness of his face. Responsibility beyond everything that I might or might not have committed towards the other. Everything that my deed will or will not have been, as if I were consecrated to the other person even before I am consecrated to myself. The responsibility for my neighbor lies before my freedom in an unthinkable past, unimaginable, in a past that was never present. I read it again. Responsibility for the other, for the next person, in the nakedness of his face. Responsibility beyond everything that I might or might not have committed towards the other, everything that my deed will or will not have been, as if I were consecrated to the other person even before I am consecrated to myself. The responsibility for my neighbor lies before my freedom in an unthinkable past, unimaginable, in a past that was never present. So he speaks about a responsibility that it's beyond my imagination, that relies in the ground, so to say. Yeah, so going towards the end, uh, I would like um, to read from um talk from uh, yeah from a very moving speech that his friend and student Derrida um, gave when Emmanuel Levinas died in December 1995. So this was uh, on the occasion of his death, this speech on the 27th of December in the cemetery in Paris, in Paris, and, um, and Derrida starts, begins saying the following, a long time ago, so long ago, I feared having to say adieu to Emmanuel Levinas. Yeah, and then he says, what means that word? A word, this word adieu, that he learned with Levinas. And it's in French, adieu. And in French, it has two meanings. Well, he says three meanings. It is adieu in the sense of saying goodbye. It can say also adieu in the sense of being a blessing. But it means also adieu, towards God, to God. And now he says, Derrida says he is there in this situation, in the need yeah, of this moment that he was for so long fear, uh, uh, in fear of, that there will be the moment to say adieu to Levinas. And I will read, I will quote a little passage of this speech. As always, but as always in a unique way, the same meditation took up 
all the great themes to which Emmanuel Levinas' thinking was encouraged us. First of all, that of the responsibility, but a limitless responsibility that goes beyond my freedom and precedes it. One of incon unconditional yes, as it says in this text, a yes that is older than any naive spontaneity, a yes that fits in with, us, with that honest, honesty that means primordial fidelity to an indissoluble alliance. And then he says, I cannot and I do not want to try to measure a few words here against the work of Emmanuel Levinas. This is so large that one cannot even recognize its borders. And one would have to begin by learning once again to think of it and of totality and infinite, for example. What is a work? What is fruitfulness? We can also confid confidently assume that centuries of readings will deal with him. We already have thousands of signs of this, day after day, beyond France and Europe, thanks to all the works in so many languages, thanks to so many translations, so many lectures and seminars, so many colloquias, and so on. The echo of this thinking has changed the course of philosophical reflection on philosophy, on what it assigns to ethics, to a different thinking of ethics, to responsibility, to justice, to the state. A different way of thinking about the other, a far never way of thinking than in many other new approaches, because it is orientated towards the absolute primacy of the face of the other. And I would like to, to end with two things. First, I will read the final part of a text, and in the very end I will quote again the first quote I read here for the beginning. But, for, but now the final lines of a text called Monotheism and Language, and this, is, this was a speech he held at the meeting organized by the Union des Étudiants Juifs in the winter of 1959. And this text is in the book, Difficult Freedom. And here he speaks about the task of the monotheistic religions. He speaks about the common task of Jews, of Christians and Muslims. And this text reminds us on many of, quest of the questions that we have been thinking on and living with also through the last decades and very, very deeply and very existentially in the last weeks. And I would like just to quote um, the final lines of this text because he says here he speaks about the unbelievable difficulty to say something, to say something when we face this unbelievable struggles and this huge and horrifying suffering of people. So I will read the final paragraph of this text. I know that one can no longer believe the words because one can no longer speak in this tormented world. One can no longer speak for no one can begin his speech without immediately testifying to something quite different from what he says. Psychoanalysis and sociology are watching the speaker. If one denounces mystification one already gives the impression 
of mystifying again. But we, Jews, Muslims and Christians, we monotheists, are here to break the spell, to say words that break free from the context that disfigures them, to say words that begin with the one who says them, to find again the word that decides, the word that answers the note, the prophetic word. I will read it again. I know that one can no longer believe the words because one can no longer speak in this tormented world. One can no longer speak for one can begin his speech without immediately testifying, for no one can begin his speech without immediately testifying to something quite different from what he was saying. Psychoanalysis and sociology are watching the speaker. If one denounces mystification, one already gives the impression of mystifying again. But we, Jews, Muslims and Christians, we monotheists are here to break the spell, to say words that break free from the context that disfigures them, to say words that begin with the one who says them, to find again the word that decides, the word that answers the note, the prophetic word. Yeah, and to finish again the first quote, as I said, it's from this book, Some Reflections About the Philosophy of Hitlerism. Does the subject reach the human state before taking responsibility for the other human being in the election that raises him to this level of being a human being, an election that comes from a God or from God who looks at him in the face of the other human being, his fellow human being, the original place of revelation. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a very good evening or morning and we will be very happy next week if we meet again for the lecture on Paul Celan. Thank you very much. <laughs>